And uh, the title of my message today is, Are You Awake Yet? Are You Awake Yet? While I was away, God kept asking me to look at something that has happened in the world over the last two years. And I didn't quite understand why until I went back and examined it all. Um, and so I'm going to open this message by talking about what's happened to Hong Kong in the last couple of years. And then I'm going to draw a parallel between what's happening in Hong Kong and what's happening to the church here in Australia and here overseas. And not just here, but overseas. In fact, across the West, the church is entering into a new season and it's one that's going to be quite challenging. And so uh, I'll give you just the background of what's happened in Hong Kong the last couple of years. In April 2019, um, an extradition bill was introduced in Hong Kong, which meant that people facing criminal charges could be extradited to China. Now, China owns Hong Kong, but they've uh, paid lip service up until now to having a different democratic system in Hong Kong to the totalitarian communist regime in China. But part of the change that they, they are making to completely take over Hong Kong was started with this extradition bill. If somebody's on a criminal charges, they can be extradited out of Hong Kong into China and tried in China. Now, this sparked, this sparked massive protests in Hong Kong and hundreds of thousands of protesters basically shut the whole place down for months on end. You would have seen it on the news. It was one of the, the biggest news stories of 2019. Now, China responded by eventually withdrawing that extradition bill in November of that year, but that was only a slight pause in their agenda because since then they have slowly but surely strangled the pro-democracy movement by arresting its peaceful leaders, by suspending council elections. It's the councils that run Hong Kong, um, uh, the, the territory of Hong Kong, and China knew that um, with the elections that were supposed to be held, they were going to have a complete uh, landslide victory, the pro-democracy movement, so they shut down the elections. Uh, they they've been kicking democratically elected leaders out of government, and they've been moving towards a complete takeover of the territory. And just yesterday, they announced that even primary school music teachers now have to teach national security and Chinese identity as part of their music classes. Along the way, China discovered that there was no nation that was prepared to actually stand up in a meaningful way for Hong Kong, and nobody, nobody was prepared to stand up in a meaningful way to China. Hundreds of thousands of people demonstrating on the streets of Hong Kong made no difference to the agenda of China. And as I was refreshing myself in what's been happening in that place, uh, the Lord kept bringing this word to my mind. That word is implacable. Now, the word implacable means not to be appeased, not to be mollified or pacified. In other words, an implacable enemy never changes course. It's always coming at you with victory in mind. It is relentless and remorseless. What does this have to do with my Sunday sermon? Why am I talking about Hong Kong in Open Heaven Church? Well, my title is, Are You Awake Yet? What has happened to Hong Kong is a pretty good symbol of what is happening to the church right across the West. Freedoms are being systematically removed in what have been known up until now as Christian nations. Legislation is being not just introduced but passed in Western nations, including our own legislation that criminalizes Christian belief. Does that shock you? I'm not exaggerating. Criminalizes Christian belief. I'll come back to this in a minute. People will say, and I've had somebody say this to me, oh, John, you should never mix religion and politics. People of faith should not engage in the political realm. Church and state are separate. What are you trying to do? Do you want to interfere with our democratic processes? 
But you see, the political realm has been invaded by the enemy. Democracy has been invaded by the enemy. And forces within what were our democratic societies are inexorably, implacably, relentlessly and remorselessly moving towards the persecution of the church and that time is here now. On September the 1st, I, went, I was very careful to go back and check this because anything that I say to do with the prophetic has come under a huge amount of attack over the last month. And there's some things that I would love to say publicly, but i just got to go like this. Because people don't understand what the role of the prophet is in our society. And if you look through the Old Testament, prophesi- prophets prophesied over nations. They, they, they prophesied the intention, the heart of God over entire nations. And so I was looking back and I thought I've got to be very careful about what I say, and so I went back and checked. And on the 1st of September 2013, I started to preach a four-part series on grace. And before I, before I started that message, um, in that particular service, I released a prophetic word that the Lord had given me during the pre- previous week that we had 10 years left of religious freedom here in Australia. 10 years. I'm talking about 10 literal physical years. Don't, don't give me all that. You know, the, a year is as a thousand, a day is as a thousand years to the Lord. This was 10 years, 10 years, physical years as we know them, left of religious freedom here in Australia. That means if that word was exact and literal, which I believe that that word the Lord gave me was, um, religious freedom will be gone in Australia by the end of August next year. August 2022 would mark the end of religious freedom in Australia. Are you awake yet? Unfortunately, that particular prophetic word is right on track within the time frame that I prophesied. Let me tell you what happened in Melbourne this this week. There was a bill introduced into the Victorian Parliament, the State Parliament of Victoria called the Change or Suppression, in brackets, Conversion Practices Prohibition Bill. This thing has now been passed. It is law in Victoria. In the state of Victoria, if you contravene what it says in this particular bill, you will be prosecuted with a maximum 10 years in jail and a $250,000 fine. What is this bill about? Well, it's aimed at what they call gay conversion therapy practices. Now, put your hand up if you've ever been part of a gay conversion therapy program. Nobody. Has any of you ever ministered in a gay conversion therapy program? Nobody, because it doesn't exist. Gay conversion therapy is something that the church has been branded with, and people have come out of the woodwork and said, that um, oh, we were treated like this, we were treated like that. Isn't it horrific? They are suppressing our true identity and all these sorts of things. And so this bill introduced by uh, Dan- Dan- Daniel Andrews' government in Victoria aims to stop um, anybody of any faith, not just Christian, Buddhist, Islam, you name it, they're all covered, Uh, bans people from attempting to minister to people to bring them out of homosexuality into the freedom that's promised in the Bible. But it's only when you actually examine the content of the bill that you see the wider agenda at work. And so, for instance, let me give you um, an example that will show you that what this bill does is effectively criminalize the Christian faith. So I'll give you an example because the bill explicitly states that its coverage is not limited to Victoria, it's Australia wide. Now obviously this hasn't been tested yet, right, in a court. Somebody will end up getting taken to court and this will be tested but the intent of the bill is Australia wide. So let's say for instance I'm sitting at home this afternoon and I get a phone call from somebody who lives in Melbourne and they say to me, Pastor John, I have, I've been reading my Bible and it, it, it shows me what uh, the Bible expects of me in terms of, um, uh, of marriage, in terms of identity, 
in terms of wholeness, in terms of healing. And I see things promised here in the Word of God to me um, that I don't quite understand yet, but I want to be free of what I've walked in in the past. Now, if I was to say to that person, well, uh, you know, if you read your Bible, you'll find the truth of what God says um, about these matters and hang up the phone, I have just broken that law and I am liable to prosecution to the extent of 10 years in jail or a $250,000 fine. That's how widespread this thing is. Let me, let, me tell, let, me, let me explain to you the other sneaky aspect of it. They give another example in the law. And the example that they give is, let's say, for instance, um, I better not use anybody as an example. Because, because Let's say you have a child who has, a, uh, who has mum and dad and dad has decided that he's gay and he's leaving the family and the child, let's say it's an adult child, 25, 30 years old, says to their parent, um, you know, the Bible says this about these matters and tries to persuade their father that they should not leave the family and go into an alternative lifestyle. That child, no matter what age, adult or child, is liable to criminal prosecution. Now, you might think, well, how many times does that happen? Not very often. But you see, because they've used that example, the reverse is now also true. So if a parent should have a child that expresses certain desires or inclinations, that parent is prohibited from suppressing what they call is a gay identity. That's what this law is aimed at. So if you as a parent should counsel your child according to the word of God about their sexuality, you are up for 10 years in jail or a $250,000 fine. Are you awake yet? If I should... Uh, If somebody should come out at the altar call at the end of our service today and we're in a church service in in Victoria, right? Or let's say there's a Victorian visitor in our church service and at the end of the service today, they come out the front of our church and they say, I want to renounce my past identity and I've been walking in what the Bible uh, calls sexual sin. Will you pray with me? While I renounce this, if I pray with that person, I'm up for 10 years in jail and a $250,000 fine. Are you awake yet? I'm going to keep asking you this because the church needs to be awakened. You don't need need to be woke. You need to be awake. And there is a big difference. The Christian faith is now under siege right across the West. The central truths that most Christians hold as essential to our Christian walk and life are being eroded by a remorseless, relentless, implacable enemy. And many of that enemy's allies are within the church pushing a humanistic form of Christianity that attempts to remove the absolute standards of God's word in order to appease the increasingly militant antichrist culture around us. We live in an antichrist culture. That's what has been established by a minority. A minority in our nation. When is the majority going to start standing up? The effect of this influence is to create a God of our own making. And this process is already underway. And I want to give you some examples from the Barna Institute, a very highly respected research institute in the United States of America that talks about faith matters and takes surveys across the broad spectrum of Christian churches to establish where we're at in our faith. So this is in America, but I tell you what, it's just as relevant to Australia as it is to America. So here's some statistics. 76% of... This is just... I'm only going to talk about Pentecostals here, okay? So us, right? You know, born again, baptised in the Holy Spirit, praying in tongues, going after God hard. (sighs) 
That's how I identify. 76% of Pentecostals reject the view that we are basically sinners in need of salvation. They say that we are essentially good. The Bible teaches us that we were lost in our sin before we came to Jesus. But 76% of Pentecostals reject that view. 69% reject the idea of absolute moral truth. I'm not going to dwell on all these because I'll never get to the end of my message. 50% of Pentecostals believe that good works will get you to heaven. 45% reject that salvation is only assured by re repentance and receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. 45%, nearly half of Pentecostals, reject the idea that salvation is only by Christ alone. 32% reject that the Bible is the infallible Word of God. A third of Pentecostals, you know, the on fire, spirit filled, <laughs> washed in the blood. Baptized in fire. Only 50% believe that the Bible is unambiguous about its teaching on abortion. These are scary statistics. If you have, and so let me sum it up like this, those, that set of statistics, let me sum it up like this. If you have a Christian who was never a sinner, who believes that all truth is relatives, is relative, who believes, well, I can do some charitable works and they will get me to heaven who doesn't believe that Jesus is the only way to the Father, who doesn't believe that the Bible is the Word of God, who believes that abortion is something that God is fine with, you might think you have something, but it's not Christianity according to the Bible. And what I see in this bill that's being passed in the Victorian Parliament, is now state law in Victoria, is that this is an attack on the Word of God and the right of Christians to express their faith in the way that the Bible instructs us to do. Mark 3.25, Jesus said, If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. So off the back of this introduction, let's go to today's scriptural passage. And we're going to Ephesians chapter 5, and we're looking at verses 8 through 14. Are you awake yet? You're going to go, you'll be going to sleep tonight and you'll be going, are you awake yet? Oh. <laughs> In Ephesians 5, starting at verse 8, it says, For you were once darkness. <laughs> yeah, come on, everyone say this. I was once darkness. <laughs> In case you're struggling between what happened before you knew Jesus and afterwards, that brings it into very sharp relief. You were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Say that with me. I am light in the Lord. I am light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. For it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. Therefore, he says, Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Are you awake yet? Not woke. Are you awake yet? Are you awake yet? Because we're going to break this down, but before we do, I want to show you why Paul is giving those verses to us, why he's giving us this admonition. In Ephesians 5 verse 1, it says, Therefore be imitators of God as dear children, and walk in love as Christ also has loved us and given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling aroma. Then he goes, he gives us this warning, but fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not even be named among you as is fitting for saints, neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know, that no fornicator, unclean person, nor covetous man who is an idolater has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Are you awake yet? <laughs> this is sobering scripture. This is the word of God. 
you can draw the inference from what Paul says here, that if you want to lose your inheritance in Christ, be a fornicator, be an unclean person, be covetous, be an idolater. I'm not saying that one unclean act disinherits you. I'm saying that choosing a lifestyle in direct opposition to the word of God places you in grave spiritual danger. How far have we removed ourselves from the truth of God's word? Well, covetousness. That's wanting something that doesn't belong to you. Covetousness is pretty much a requirement for what is seen as success in Western civilization. I want that house. I want that flat screen TV, you know, a 75-inch jobby that's got the nice speakers on it. I want that car. I've got to have this particular job. I've got to have these clothes. I dare not look at a female in the house this morning. <laughs> or increasingly any males. <laughs> I've got to have those clothes. I've got to have that salary. Then I'll be satisfied. Let me give you one more statistic from the Barner Institute. Only 52% of Pentecostals agree with the statement, success is consistent obedience to God. Only half of Pentecostals, you know, born again, on fire, washed in the blood, he baptized the fire of the Holy Spirit. I'm going hard after God. Only half of us believe that success is consistent obedience to God. Consistent obedience to God is our calling. When we go back to, as we continue in uh, Ephesians 5, 6 and 7... Paul goes on to say about fornication, uncleanness, covetousness, and idolatry, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things, the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore, do not be partakers with them. If you partake of these things, you are putting yourself next to the wrath of God, which is coming upon them. How are we awake yet? How many of us have ever even considered being under the wrath of God? But that's where we were before Christ. Do you remember that? Do you remember being full of darkness? Do you remember the lifestyle that you led? Do you remember the roads that took you down? Do you remember the destruction and the damage it did to your heart, to your family, to your relationships, to your destiny? to what God had always intended to you? Do you remember what that darkness did to you? The beauty of God's salvation by grace through faith is that it does not matter what lifestyle you took part in before you came to Christ. It doesn't matter because the blood of Jesus does away with all of it. The moment you invited Jesus into your heart, the presence of the Holy Spirit took up residence within you to lead you into all truth, to bear witness to your transformation and to empower that transformation. You are never meant to stay where you were. You are never even meant to stay where you are now. We have a consistent upward spiral into the things of the Lord instead of what we used to walk in, which was a consistently downward spiral into further darkness. Transformation inevitably means you are in the world but not of it. And that's okay in predominantly Christian culture, but what happens when that culture turns against Christ as it is now? At some point, as our culture moves further and further from its Judeo-Christian foundations, we find ourselves in conflict with the culture around us. We are at that point now, and God is asking us, are you awake yet? 
See, in this passage of Scripture in Ephesians, Paul is drawing some very clear lines for us in regard to an acceptable lifestyle as followers of Jesus. In Colossians, he tells us that we have been delivered out of darkness. And God stopped me in this Scripture in Colossians for a moment because I had to look something up because it says, He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. This is Colossians 1.13. Delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of His love. That word uh, conveyed is actually the same as translated. You know, when you read in the book of Acts where, where Philip is translated immediately from one physical location to another, that's how dramatic our departure from the kingdom of darkness is. That's how dramatic our translation into the kingdom of the Son of His light is. We become sons of light. So bearing this in mind, here is what we are to do according to this chapter in Ephesians. And now we go back to our original scripture that I referenced. Ephesians 5 verse 8 says, For you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. And I looked up all the different translations to make sure it wasn't just a, like a, a, a mistranslation. It wasn't just saying, you know, oh, you once walked in darkness or you were affected by darkness. And I was looking through all these translations and they're all going, you were once darkness, you were once darkness, you were once darkness. And the uh, complete Jewish Bible says, you used to be darkness. You used to be darkness. That's who we were. What is the light worth to us? He goes on to say, you were once darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of the Spirit is in all goodness, righteousness, and truth, finding out what is acceptable to the Lord. As we read the Word of God, the Holy Spirit ministers truth to us, leads us into all truth, and that truth inevitably demands a response from us. And the response is what Paul outlines in the next verse, verse 11. And have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. He's not saying don't have fellowship with unbelievers. He's saying don't have fellowship, don't invite into your heart the works of that darkness. If I was an addict in the past, I'm not to be an addict in my future. If I have a friend who is walking in any particular type of sin, I can still have that friendship, but I'm supposed to be light to his darkness, not inviting his darkness into my sphere of influence. For it is shameful, verse 12, for it is shameful even to speak of those things which are done by them in secret, but all things that are exposed are made manifest by the light, for whatever makes manifest is light. What light is he talking about? He's talking about the light that's within you. The light that is within me. Have you ever um, had a conversation with somebody where, um, where you can just tell they are so uncomfortable even being around you? You'll find that with people that are steeped in witchcraft or certain lifestyles. I'll tell you, we, we were, uh, Kerry and I were, were down south this week and we were coming home. We decided we were going to stop in Bega and we were going to get a coffee. And so we walked into this coffee shop and as soon as we walked in, I thought there's something about this atmosphere that is completely wrong, completely wrong. And I started looking around and I started looking at the person behind the counter, not going to identify anybody or what they were walking in. But as, as I looked around and I saw certain posters up on the wall and this, that and the other, I saw this person is trapped in this sin and this thing is an offence to me and it's coming against me. And I just had to bind it and rebuke it and push it back. And their coffee wasn't that good either. And we all know how important coffee is to the Christian lifestyle, right? <laughs> uh, the Amplified says about this conflict between light and, and darkness in Ephesians 5.13. It says, when anything is exposed and reproved by the light. In other words, the light in you is coming against the darkness in the people that you encounter. Their darkness doesn't like being exposed. And there's something in you that exposes sin. When anything is exposed and reproved by the light, it is made visible and clear. And where everything is visible and clear, there is light. 
you can't see how dark you could not see how dark you were until the light of the gospel began to shine in your heart. Is that right? Can anyone wave a hand at me and give testimony to that truth? Because we were absolutely corrupted in our wickedness and sin that's been handed down from Adam and Eve all the way through. And then we have this encounter with God and the light of His glory comes and shines upon us and it illuminates my darkness and I'm starting to go, oh, I don't think that's supposed to be there. Oh, I don't think that's supposed to be there. I, I don't even have any control over this one. What am I going to do about this? I'm helpless against this thing. And God says, no, 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 hang on a minute. I'm in charge now. I'm going to do something about it. You just keep following me. You keep pursuing me. And don't you dare invite that darkness into your heart. See, light attracts, but it also exposes. So God wants us to shine so that those in darkness are attracted to the light in us. But sometimes... And this should be increasingly the case for every single one of us. Sometimes that light is so strong, it doesn't just expose darkness. It actually exposes the demons behind the darkness affecting people. And that's why sometimes you'll see in our church when we do altar calls, people come forward, they get prayed for, and they begin manifesting. What's happening when they're manifesting? What's happening is the light of God is going to against that darkness and that force of darkness, that demonic entity that is behind that uh, darkness is getting agitated and it starts to manifest until it is dealt with in the authority of the blood of Jesus. And so we go on to verse 14 and he says, Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep, arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. Now, whenever I see therefore in the Bible, I want to know what the therefore is there for. And so, um, what's the therefore therefore? Because the light that is in you exposes and makes darkness manifest around you, therefore, he says, awake you who sleep. In other words, be awake to what you actually carry. Arise from the dead and Christ will give you light. When we step away from dead works, when we step away from the sins of our past, when we step away from the wickedness of the culture around us, there is something of increase in the light that is entrusted to us. And as I went hunting in this, I saw that most commentaries link this scripture, that phrase, arise, uh, sorry, uh, Awake you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Most commentaries link that scripture to Isaiah 61, 60 verse 1. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. And that's perfectly accurate. But let me suggest something to you that's possibly even a more direct reference. I would like us to consider something a little left of center here. What if Paul was referring to Jonah in the bottom of the boat? Not in the belly of the the fish, but in the bottom of the boat. Because the captain of that boat, when the storm is about to sink everybody and everybody's about to die, he comes to Jonah and grabs him by the shoulder and says to him, What do you mean, sleeper? Arise, call on your God. Perhaps your God will consider us so that we may not perish. And Jonah awoke. He confessed his sin. He recommitted himself to the purpose that God has for his life. And not only were the people on the boat saved, but the the most wicked city of that generation repented. And the wrath of God was put back by two generations, two and a half generations, a hundred years. Nineveh, the most wicked city on the face of the earth, repented. They even made the donkeys have sackcloth and ashes. They weren't allowed. They had to, even the donkeys could not could not eat. They, were, they, they made the animals fast. They came into this incredible repentance and the wrath of God was pushed back for a hundred years and two and a half generations of Ninevites knew what it was like to have relationship with God. So when, um, when it says, Awake, you who sleep, arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light, 
I see this parallel between us and Jonah. If we would only awaken to what God has for us. Having been commissioned to bring repentance, revival and reformation, we have instead been asleep and in compromise. I'm talking generally and I'm talking to all the Pentecost. All the Pentecostals, all the Pentecostals that are watch this online, half of us are compromised. More than half of us have stepped into things that are completely opposed to the Bible. And God is asking us, are you awake yet? Because awakening must come. But it starts with us and can and has brought the transformation of a nation. And here I went off on another tangent and I'm going to start trying to wrap this up and land the plane because we're already at 12 o'clock, but hopefully you'll bear with me for a few more minutes. Have, it, have any of you ever wondered or considered how the United States of America became the most Christian nation on earth? Have you ever thought, I wonder what it is in the history of the United States of America that made it the greatest missionary sending nation of all history, the most Christian nation on the face of it. How did that happen? Well, it's not just the Puritan foundations that the first of those explorers brought from, from England when they planted a colony there. It's not just those Puritan foundations. There was a series of awakenings across the United States of America across hundreds of years that established something in that nation. In the first great awakening, which was the 1730s and 1740s, so a 20-year pretty much nationwide revival led by Jonathan Edwards and George Whitefield, the entire nation came into repentance and came into the things of the Lord. In the second great awakening, uh, which was from the 1790s through the 1830s, we're talking about 1790, 1800, 1810, 1820, 1830. 50 years of revival. We're happy if we get five days. Has anybody read about the Second Great Awakening, that revival? Let me give you one paragraph quote. In that, uh, this was something that was taking place all across America. And this was just before um, just before the uh, Civil War. Let me read somebody's eyewitness description of something called the Cane Ridge Revival. So this is out in the middle of nowhere in the wilds of Kentucky. And Christians around the place and non-Christians are hearing that there is a move of God in these open fields. And so they're coming by horse and cart. They're coming by horseback. They're coming by mule. They're, coming, they're walking. They're doing whatever they can to get to this place. And there are thousands and thousands of people out in these open fields. And here's this uh, eyewitness who stands there in the midst of this. And this is what he says. The noise was like the roar of Niagara. How many of you have been to Niagara Falls? Those of you who have been there, I've been there, is as the boat comes close to the, that cascade of water, it is deafening. It is so loud. And here this man says, The noise was like the roar of Niagara. The vast sea of human beings seemed to be agitated as if by a storm. I counted seven ministers. There's no PA systems. There's nothing like that. There's just minister after minister after minister, revivalist after revivalist after revivalist, evangelist, prophets, teeth, everybody up there on stumps, on the backs of carriages, preaching to whoever. The, the, to whoever is within the sound of their voice. The vast sea of human beings seem to be agitated as if by a storm. I counted seven ministers, all preaching at one time, some on stumps, others on wagons. Some of the people were singing, others praying, some crying for mercy. A peculiarly strange sensation came over me. My heart beat tumultuously. My knees trembled, my lips quivered, and I felt as though I must fall to the ground. And his eyewitness testimony was that thousands of people would fall fall under the spirit of the Lord as, the, as God moved in revival and a nation continued to be transformed. Yeah. 
at the height of this revival, there were 50,000 conversions a week. Then you move forward into the 20th century. We're here in this church today because of Azusa Street. A black pastor managed to get hold of a disused horse stable in downtown Los Angeles and his ministry methodology was to sit on the front row of the seats that were there for the meetings and he would put a crate over his head to block out his surroundings until he heard the word of the Lord and he'd get up and begin to preach it. And the Holy Spirit would begin to move. Miracles began to manifest. Speaking in tongues became commonplace. The modern Pentecostal movement was birthed in that place. And I'm not downplaying what happened in England, which was almost simultaneous. But out of that, the, uh, the modern Pentecostal movement was birthed. And you are part of the fastest growing religious movement in the history of mankind, Pentecostalism. But now we come to a crossroads because I read out to you before what statistics say is that half of us believe or don't believe. And this has got to change. <clears throat> and God is saying, are you awake yet? Because you see, it starts with us. Nobody, nobody in the religious uh, in, in the the religious hierarchy of that day would have pointed to that black pastor named William Seymour and said, he's the guy that we're going to start a worldwide movement from. Nobody would have even considered him, but God considered him. He wasn't educated. I don't think he'd even been to Bible college. And yet, because he committed himself to the presence of God and what God had called him to, God used him. Who is to say that there is not a William Seymour here in these pews, here walking, watching online? See, God is asking us to draw on our faith. God is asking us to redig the ancient wells. I believe that we are coming into a season now as persecution rises against the church where if we are not walking daily with the Lord in humility, in prayer, in constantly keeping Him as the centerpiece of our lives, if, if we don't walk in that way, I wonder how many of us will stand. We live in an era of consumer Christianity that is not just excused covetousness, it has enthroned it. What can God do for me? It's all about me. What can God do for me? And so I want to want to close this. Don't say hallelujah. <laughs> I'm going to close this because I was, I was kind of going, Lord, where am I going with this? Where am I going with this? What example can I pull from Scripture that, that shows us the hard attitude that you're looking for? And God took me to the story of Abraham, but not from the book of Genesis, from the book of Hebrews. Because we all know, recognize Abraham as the father of faith. Is that correct? So in Hebrews chapter 11, starting at verse 8, the Word of God says that by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. That's pretty full on in itself. By faith he dwelt in the land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. Can you imagine living in a foreign culture of millions of people and God is saying, well, actually, all this belongs to you. All these guys have got to go. For he waited for the city which has foundations, whose builder and maker is God. The city which has foundations is there because of our faith. He is the father of faith. He stepped out not knowing where he was going. Now, that's a beautiful example to us but the writer of Hebrews gives us the actual crux, the crucial point 
to which our faith must come. When he gets to verse 17, he says, he returns to Abraham. He says, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Just stop there for a minute. Everybody knows the story of Abraham and and Isaac, right? And all the things that Abraham and Sarah went through to have that child of promise. And now the child is on the verge of manhood. He's 17 years of age and God says, you take him, you go up that mountain and you sacrifice him to me and don't tell him what you're about to do. By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called, concluding that God was able to raise him up even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. One of the reasons Abraham is called the father of faith is because of his obedience. Faith is expressed in obedience. And so when he took Isaac up onto the mountain to sacrifice him, the son of promise, the one through whom God had said all nations were going to, all these nations were going to be birthed. Even as the knife descended to kill his own son, his faith had taught him that somehow God would be faithful to the promise, even if it meant resurrecting his dead son. What is my point? My point is that in Abraham's heart, Isaac was already dead when he raised the knife. Do you see what I'm saying? Abraham's decision of obedience from faith was such that his son laid out on that altar at the top of that mountain as he looked up with his trusting eyes as his own father raised the knife to kill him. That son in Abraham's heart was dead. And such was his faith that was such was his faith that he was prepared to sacrifice all of his future in obedience to what God called him to do. This is the call of faith. This is the call of faith. This is what it means to be awake. This is what it means to birth awakening. This is what it means to live in revival culture. It's no longer about me. It is about we. It is about them. It is about us becoming the righteousness of God that he has already said we are. If he has declared it over us, surely we can walk in it. Or are the promises of God a lie? Right answer. I was listening to the worship this morning. Sella, can you bring your worship team up, please? I was listening to the worship, and I don't have any influence over the song choice of our worship team, nor do I, uh, nor do I ask them for specific songs, except in circumstances like this, when something that they've done speaks prophetically into where we are. And so I was uh, worshipping worshiping away um, with the worship team this morning, and they started singing, It's all about you, all about you. And I was, <laughs> I was thinking, This is the perfect statement that we have to make, not just with our lips, not just with our hearts, but with our lives. Because we are coming into a season where our commitment to what God has called us to is about to be sorely tested. But I believe with all my heart that even in the face of persecution, even in the face of a culture that has so far refused to bow, God can release awakening in our nation that exceeds anything that ever happened in the United States of America. Is it not yet our turn? Is it not yet time 
for the land of the, the, the great, great south land of the Holy Spirit to become what we have been prophetically named? Is it not time for revival to spring, for, to spring up within these shores and go out to the, the nations of the earth? Is it not possible that an awakened generation could bring transformation to an ungodly culture. It's happened time and time and time and time and time and time again in nations like the United States of America that have said outpouring after outpouring after outpouring. Can't we have one too? Are we second class citizens? No, we are citizens of heaven. And if we will just, if we will just make that decision and follow it with our hearts and follow it with our actions, I believe that awakening can come to our nation. Can we rise this morning? Are you awake yet? <laughs> I'm awake. Deuteronomy 31.6 says, Be strong and of good courage. Do not fear nor be afraid of them. For the Lord your God, He is the one who goes with you. He will not leave you. He will not forsake you. It doesn't matter what man throws at you. God has already made a way through. Stop counting the costs and start counting the rewards that God has promised us in response to our obedience. Amen. So as we enter into this time of worship, I don't know how you want to express your response to what has been preached this morning. But if this has touched your heart, if this is you this morning, I would invite you to just come into that secret place with God, even in the midst of our brothers and sisters, and begin speaking to the Lord about the things that He has placed upon your heart, that He has already birthed in your spirit. Begin seeking Him for what, he is, for what it is that He requires of you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for the precious Word of God. Thank you, Lord, for its power to awaken us. Help us, Lord, to walk in awakening. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Shut up, shut up, shut up, shut up. Awake, you who sleep. Arise from the dead. And Christ will give you light. Lord, we would ask for more light this morning in every heart, in Jesus' name. We're going to close the live stream. Before we do, I just want to pray for those on live stream. I want to pray for our friends in the United States of America. You just heard testimony after testimony of what God has done in your nation in the past. I just bless you guys to be harbingers of revival in your culture, in your nation. For those of you watching from other places around the face of the earth, we are all one in Christ. And God is awakening His bride to shine in this season. And I bless you with the light of the Lord. I bless you with the spirit of wisdom and revelation. I bless you with that revival fire that is coming to your home, to your family, to your surroundings, to your sphere of influence, to your nation in the name of Jesus. God bless you.